for God who said, let the light shine out of darkness, he made his light shine in our hearts to give us the light of the knowledge of God's glory displayed in the face of Christ. The word became flesh and made his dwelling place among us. We have seen his glory, the glory of the only, the, the only, the one and only son who came from the father, full of grace and truth. The heavens declare the glory of God. The skies proclaim the word of his hands. Amen. So um, I've titled this sermon today, In Full Glory, the Transfiguration. In Full Glory, the Transfiguration. Okay, so this is the text that the Lord laid on my heart to bring to you today, and it's found in three places uh, in, uh, in the Gospels. And the uh, Gospel of Mark, Matthew, and Luke. And this passage uh, on, the transfiguration, on the Transfiguration and the Majestic Glory of the Lord. And if you ever wanted to get a glimpse of what it's like being in full glory, Jesus, Jesus uh, makes that possible right here. So um, I want to start out by saying that many people have said that the Bible was written by man, but what they don't realize and fail to take into account is that it was God's choice as sovereign overall to communicate to us through the Holy Spirit, through prayer, and through verbal inspiration via the Holy Spirit as it uh, moved among men and was transferred to the written word. And so the words, which in the Greek is called rhema, and uh, I just want to point out that, you know, when you refer to like Greek, you know, when you say that that's not like we're all Greek scholars or something like that, it's just like uh, sometimes you don't get the full flavor in the translation because uh, the Bible is interpreted in the time in which it was written. So you don't get the full flavor of the meaning sometimes. So, and like you're reading the best, you're like, what does that actually mean? How did they mean it to come across? So we go back to the Greek. It gives us a fuller understanding. So uh, so when you hear us say, you know, in the Greek, it means this. It's not like we're just smarter than you, okay? So anyway, um, let me see. So uh, Jesus said in six, John 6, 63, it is the spirit who gives life. The flesh profits nothing. The words I have spoken to you are spirit and life. Uh, but I will say to you that with many authors, uh, 40 to be exact, and 66 books of the Bible, it's amazing to us humans, but now with God, that there are not many, there are not any contradictions. And if you think you found one, please point it out to me so I can refute that immediately. And because uh, the God we serve is a perfect God, and so is his word. Even if the Bible was banned by only one man, even that would be enough, and it would still be the inherent word of God. But with 40 authors carried by the Holy Spirit without contradictions, it qualifies even more so the validity of the Holy Scriptures. As Peter said, that we have the prophetic word made more sure. Most of us communicate with each other in speech, so it would be only natural for God to impart the fullness of what he desires us to know through his word. Jesus is even called the word. He is a living word, which in the Greek translates it as the divine expression that is Christ, and also as the Shekinah glory and open manifestation. Also, wow, that says a lot right there. And uh, by the way, if you like the preaching here, please share it with others on Facebook or YouTube. And so when it gets loaded, uh, uploaded, others may be encouraged to benefit from what the Lord is doing here at the Living Lighthouse. I mean, just the name Living Lighthouse speaks for itself, like the you know, you know, thousand, but uh, anyway, just you know God's doing some mighty, mighty things here. So if you would, uh, please turn to the Gospel of Luke. Instead of reading all three versions, uh, we'll just read this one. And um, we'll pick up on the context on the others as we go along. Uh, the book of Matthew, chapter 17. And we will read from verse 1 to verse 13. That's uh, chapter 17, starting in verse 1. And I'll be reading from the New American Standard today. Your translation may read a little bit different. But if you would please stand for the reading of the word. God to show respect. Okay. 
in Jesus' name. Matthew 17, starting at verse 1. And, and six days later, Jesus took with him Peter and James and John, his brother, and brought them up to a high mountain by themselves. And he was transfigured before them, and his face shone like the sun, and his garments became white as light. And behold, Moses and Elijah appeared to them, talking with him. And Peter answered and said to Jesus, Lord, it is good for us to be here. If you wish, I will make three tabernacles here, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. While he was still speaking, behold, a bright cloud overshadowed them, and behold, a voice out of the cloud saying, this is my beloved son, with whom I am well pleased. Listen to him. And when the disciples heard this, they fell on their faces and were much afraid. And Jesus came to them and touched them and said, Arise and do not be afraid. And lifting up their eyes, they saw no one except Jesus himself alone. As they were coming down from the mountain, Jesus commanded them, saying, Tell the vision to no one until the Son of Man is risen from the dead. And his disciples asked him, saying, Why then do some, why then do the scribes say that Elijah must come first? And he answered and said, Elijah is coming and will restore all things. But I say to you that Elijah already came, and they did not recognize him, but did to him whatever they wished. So also the Son of Man is going to suffer at their hands. Then the disciples understood that he had spoken to them about John the Baptist. So uh, if you'll bow your heads, we'll pray. Heavenly Father, what a privilege it is to be able to worship you today. You are so worthy of all glory and honor, thanksgiving and praise. Who are we that you would be mindful of us? Thank you for creating us in your very own image and providing all that we need to sustain us physically and spiritually. Please speak to us today loud and clear and bless your word as it goes forward. Thank you for meeting us here today. For these people are your people who have come to hear a word from you. Start preparing hearts and minds right now to receive it. If you don't move today, nothing will happen. Hide me behind the cross, they would see Jesus in him only. Keep me from error and let no flesh be glorified. It's in Jesus, my Lord's holy and righteous and precious name we ask and pray. Amen. You want to see him? Okay, so as we pointed out last week, the synoptic gospels are called that because they include many of the same stories and are often in a similar sequence and some in similar, sometimes identical wording. And they stand in contrast to John, whose content is almost totally different, and he doesn't write about the transfiguration. Okay, so in this set of passages, Matthew and Mark's gospels are very close, and Luke's gospel reads somewhat different. The writers of the different Gospels had specific audiences that they were trying to relate to. Uh, for instance, uh, Matthew's Gospel was written mainly to the Jews who had questions, and Mark's, tar Mark's Gospel targeted Gentile readers in general and uh, Roman readers in particular. Now, Luke's Gospel is slanted toward all Gentiles, so you have just like a little bit different flavor going to each one in order to talk about the same thing. So, uh, although Matthew and Mark's version of the Transfiguration reads almost identically, Luke's version reads differently, possibly because it's from the viewpoint of a physician. He was a physician. Uh, he was uh, interested in a lot of medical aspects and stuff like that that the others uh, didn't hit on. So, but as I go through this incredible account with you, I want to basically compile them together so we can see the full picture of this spectacular and miraculous event. 
Before each of these passages, we read that Jesus tells his disciples truthfully that there were some of them standing there with him that will not taste death until they see the kingdom of God after it come with power. Okay, so this is by far no small insignificant statement because what Jesus is telling them is there are some who will see the kingdom come with power in their lifetime. Now, although many of us will not see the kingdom until we die, but I believe in the, you know, there was, since we were in the last days that there are some here that will see Jesus come. Returned very close. What the disciples are about to experience is so important because it will give credibility to the disciples themselves as eyewitnesses and to authenticate their testimony to what they saw and were a part of when they walked with Jesus and would later carry out the Great Commission in the years to come. And to prove without a shadow of a doubt that Jesus is every bit of he said that he is and claims to be the Messiah, the son of the living God. And Jesus used this phrase, the kingdom of God is coming upon you two times in the Gospels. But he mentions the kingdom of God another 16 times. And in the epistles, it's stated 52 times. And that's important. We're talking about the kingdom of God. Is what Jesus said the kingdom of God has come upon you. And 2 Peter 1, 16 through 19 says, For we did not follow cleverly devised tales when we made known to you the power and the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but we were eyewitnesses of his majesty. For when he received honor and glory from the Father, such an utterance as was made to him by the majestic glory, this is my beloved Son, with whom I am well pleased. And we ourselves heard this utterance made from heaven when we were with him on the holy mountain. And so we have the prophetic word made more sure to which you would do well to pay attention as a lamp shining in a dark place until the day dawns and the morning star arises in your hearts. Who is this morning star? It's Jesus. In Revelation 22, 16, it says, I, Jesus, have sent my angel to testify to you of these things for the churches. I am the root and descendant of David, the bright morning star. So now we see that Jesus took his inner circle, his closest, I want to say his most trusted disciples, Peter, James, and John, with him on a high mountain to pray. But why just the three? Now, I believe he did that is to leave the others with the crowd down below to keep them from following up the mountain. Every, let's face it, the crowds were flocking to Jesus everywhere he went. It was so hard to get out by himself. For example, in Mark 6, 32-34, when he had crossed over the Sea of Galilee, the crowd saw where he was going. And they raced on ahead to the other side and were waiting for him when he got there. Now, I also believe that these three disciples would, in fact, relate everything that took place on top of the mountain to the others. So it wasn't just super important for them all to be there. And this mountain was either Mount Tabor, which was 10 miles southwest of the Sea of Galilee, or Mount Hermon, which was 40 miles northeast of the Sea of Galilee. Now, Mount Tabor isn't really a tall mountain. And if you go over there, they'll say, this is the mountain of transfiguration, but it's not very tall and it's not hard to climb. And now Mount Hermon is very high and hard to climb. It's not hard, it's not easy for tourists to climb it anyway. And they were already in the vicinity of Caesarea Philippi, which is right at the base of Mount Hermon. So the Lord knows which one it is. It doesn't matter which mountain it is. What matters is what happened on top of the mountain. So it says that they went up the mountain to pray. And they were to have this personal time alone with Jesus. 
I mean, there will be times when we all need to get away and have our own personal time with Jesus. Get in our secret place or wherever or whatever that is to you and just have our time alone with him. So while he was praying, he was transformed right before his very eyes. And transformed in the Greek, it's an interesting word, means metamorphosis or transformed or changed from the inside because, because of the inside. Okay, so an example of this is Jesus maintained his deity while he was here. Although they couldn't see it, he was still, you know, he had it inside of him. He's, and even though he could see he was still 100% God and 100% man. And he chose to express or manifest it outwardly at that time in his bodily, uh, in his bodily appearance. His glory was hidden or veiled inside his humanity. But he went from the unseen manifestation to the seen manifestation, from the invisible glory to the visible glory right before their very eyes. It says while he was praying, it also shows us not to underestimate the power of prayer. And we are all benefactors of answer prayer. And it's the power of God that makes that happen. We have the Holy Spirit inside of us. So we have the Spirit of God in us. We pray. There's, there's power in prayer. So get a picture of this because this is mind loving to me. Okay. The deity of Christ is beyond anything that we as humans could gaze upon and live. And his face shone like the brilliance and the intensity of the sun. Like, have you ever looked at the sun? Like, you, you can't because it's so bright. Like, right away, you have your, your hand up in front of your eyes blocking it out or looking through your fingers if you're trying to see something in the distance. Now, Moses' face shone after meeting with God because it was the reflected light of the glory of God. That light of glory wasn't coming from him. It was the reflection of Christ when he met with him in the Old Testament. The Shekinah glory, the glory of God. He is the light. Now, speaking about light, <laughs> this is so cool. I like how one man put this. Like, if you see a lemon, you automatically know what color it is, right? It's yellow, okay? But if you put that in a blacked out room with no light, what color is it? There's no color, because without the light of God, there would be nothing. Imagine the pitch darkness, so dark you can't see anything, no light. What kind of existence would that be? I mean, what would the world look like without the light of God? You know, no doubt, formless and void, right? So um, Jesus says of hell, he calls it outer darkness, whereas the complete absence of light whatsoever. See, there is, there's light, and then there's darkness, and there's like outer darkness, outside of any light. But that's nothing for God to accomplish. Will that not add or amplify to the utter misery there of what is burning or eating you up? Like hell was created for punishment or incarceration after all, for those who don't want anything to do with God. Well, it goes on to say that his clothes became white. It's as white as light, gleaming white. They were exceedingly white, whiter than any launderer could get them. Like if you couldn't put any more bleach to whiten them anymore. If you took all the colors that you can see and meld them together, you would have absolutely pure white light. That's the light that's coming from this. It says in the text of Mark that a launderer or a fuller couldn't get them any whiter. Like, I didn't even know they had those back then. But anyway, Mark goes on to saying that his garments became radiant. So not only was Jesus' face shining like the sun, but his garments were radiant also. That radiance is described like highly polished metal buffed to the brightest reflective, reflective glare. Also, like the sun, white. White, by the way, is a symbol of holiness and purity and righteousness. 
And I'm just sharing this with you, so hang on. This is another awesome fact here. The radiance or Shekinah glory that was coming from Jesus is best described from what it says in Hebrews 1, 3. Now listen to this. And he is the radiance of his glory and the exact representation of his nature. This refers to Christ's eternal radiance, supremely reflecting the effulgent or emanating glory of the Godhead. Man, do we serve an awesome God or what? Amen. God is light. This eternal light breaks through all darkness. All the darkness that keeps someone in spiritual darkness, ignorance, or bondage, or every resistance exerted by sin. When he calls you out of darkness into his marvelous light, you can't resist it. I got Brother Judy with this the other day about the Apostle Paul, Saul, before his conversion. He was so all, all in against Jesus. Like no one could have been more, more in or against the persecution of the way and the Christians. Like I can just see him with letters in hand to bring back more Christians going out and bringing back more Christians and saying, here's another one. And then heading back out to get to get some more. But when the light knocked him down from his high horse on the Damascus road, when he saw that light, the light of Christ, he was on his face. It literally changed his life. and He was never the same again. Then you couldn't find anyone more in for Jesus. Jesus called his name and he came. God knows our very name. When he calls our name, we will rise again. We will come forth alive or dead, just like Lazarus. That's the power of our God. Jesus was in full glory, and the light of God goes hand in hand with his glory. God is the light of the world. In him was life, and that life is the light of men. And the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not comprehend or overcome it. Now, I want to hit on this light because it's the very essence and emanation from him combined with the glory of God. In Matthew, it says the birth of Jesus, at the birth of Jesus, the people who were sitting in darkness saw a great light, and those who were sitting in the land of the shadow of death, upon them a light dawn. It says, and in the same region, there were some shepherds staying out in the fields and keeping watch over their flock by night. And an angel of the Lord stood before them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terribly frightened. And the angel said to them, Do not be afraid, for behold, I bring you good news of great joy, which shall be for all the people. For today in the city of David, there has been born for you a Savior who is Christ the Lord. You can see the light in the people of the Lord that have the light of Christ in them, they just glow. With the radiance of the Holy Spirit, God in us. I mean, you. I know that y'all have seen people, you can just tell that they're filled with the Spirit just by the glow that's coming from them. So Jesus pulled back the curtain so we can get a glimpse of him in the fullness of his glory. Like, it was literally heaven on earth. Why do I say that? Because Jesus said some of them would not taste death until they saw the kingdom of God. After it come with power, his power, he made it happen. This is a preview and taste of what being in full glory is like. Let's face it, whatever words we choose to describe it falls way short of how it truly was. Like when Paul was caught up in the paradise and heard the inexpressible words, which a man is not to repeat. Can you imagine being called up there? I mean, whether it's mind or spirit, what an honor. It goes on to say, and Elijah or Elias, as some translations have, 
as he is known as he's known to some, appeared to them along with Moses and was talking to Jesus. And Jesus brought them forth. And now they were standing before him. When Jesus commands your presence, you will appear before him. How did the disciples know it was Moses and Elijah? Well, the simple explanation is because that's how it's going to be in the kingdom. We will know each other, I believe, without introductions or name tags. We know now that the Holy Spirit teaches us all things and shows us all things. How much more then? You know, there's a lot that we could only speculate on now that will most assuredly become evident later. But in addition, it says, Moses and Elijah were appearing in glory. They were in their glorified bodies. They had already, they had already received. But once we depart our earthly life, this body, this vessel, this fragile clay jar is done. Now, I do want to point out that even when we die, although we can't take anything with us, there is one thing that we can take with us, and that is all the spiritual knowledge, the truth, and the Bible doctrine that we learn. It says in 1 Corinthians 15, 51 and 52, Behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet, for the trumpet will sound, and the dead will be raised imperishable, and we shall be changed. How exactly that works remains to be seen. That's why it is a mystery. This passage says also that if we are alive when Christ comes, we will be translated, changed, transformed, transfigured into a glorified body fit for heaven and to be with him. Man, there's a lot here also. Moses and Elijah knew of the plan. They had already knew, they, they already knew that he was on his way to the cross. Can you imagine this, that Jesus had already told them about the fulfillment of the salvation plan that they had prophesied about? Okay, so why Moses and why Elijah? Well, we know Moses represented the law and the feasts and the sacrifices and the foreshadowing of Jesus. And Elijah was a representation of the prophets and all the prophecies concerning Jesus. So here they were, the law and the prophets standing before the one who is the very fulfillment and the completion of all those things. They were speaking with him about his diseases. That's, and that's used sometimes uh, in different translations in Luke 9, 31, which he was about to accomplish in Jerusalem. And in the Greek, diseases, that means like an exodus or a journey or the event of dying or departure from life that he was about to take up. They were talking about Jesus' exodus. Now, Moses couldn't take the people into the land of promise. It had to be Joshua, whose name in the Hebrew is Yeshua, which means salvation. But Moses, who died, represented all those who died in faith in the Lord and went or would eventually go to be with Jesus. And Elijah, who was translated or taken up while he was still alive, represents all those who would be caught up with the Lord at a future time, who live by faith. If the disciples wanted assurance of life after death, then here it is right before their eyes, because Moses had been dead for about 1,400 years, and Elijah about 900 years, and yet here they are. How important is that? It's everything to the believer and the unbeliever alike. It shows eternal life past the grave with Jesus. The promise fulfilled to believers made more sure. Like this is the real deal. Now Peter and his companions have been overcome with sleep. So like right away in my mind, I wanted to think that they were on their faces because of the sheer awe and terror that you see in other places in scripture. 
or because of the majesty that we're witnessing in the presence of Jesus in full glory. Possibly it was because it was because it was a high mountain and it was a long, towering way to the top. But the text just reads that they were overcome by sleep. But what woke them up was the brightness and the brilliance of his glory. Another real miracle here is that Christ was able to keep from displaying his glory during his ministry before now. Like when you looked, you didn't see the glory, but here it's coming out. So when they were fully awake, they saw his glory. And it came about as Moses and Elijah were parting from them. Now Peter, being terrified and knowing not what to say, answered and said, Lord, it is good for us to be here. Let us make three tabernacles, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. And a tabernacle is a portable sanctuary commonly made out of sticks and constructed as a place of worship. But right away while he was still speaking, the father shut that down because Jesus would be the only one deserving of worship and not honor. And we all know Peter, not to be outdone, sometimes says things or acts without thinking. I mean, how many of us do that, right? In the Old Testament, God's presence was very well known, even to pagans. There was the pillar of fire by night, the pillar of cloud by day with the Israelites in the wilderness. So he sometimes chose to manifest himself or make his presence known by enveloping himself in a cloud. In 2 Chronicles 5.13, it says, Then the house, the house of the Lord was filled with a cloud. Psalm 99.7 says, And he spoke to them in a pillar of cloud. Ezekiel 10.4 says, then the glory of the Lord went up from the cherub to the threshold of the temple, and the temple was filled with the cloud, and the court was filled with the brightness and the glory of the Lord. Luke 21, 27, and they will see the Son of Man coming in a cloud with power and great glory. Revelation 14, 14, and I looked and behold the white cloud, and sitting on the cloud was one like the Son of Man, having a golden crown on his head and a sharp sickle in his hand. While well, a cloud overshadowed them and a voice came out of the cloud and said, this is my son, my chosen one, my beloved son, listen to him. When they heard that, they had fallen on their faces in terror. When God speaks to you, you will be on your face and you won't have an answer for him unless he asks you for it. In Isaiah chapter 6, Isaiah said, Woe is me, for I am undone, because I am a man of unclean lips, and I live among a people of unclean lips. And the angel had to take a coal from the altar and touch it to his lips and cleanse him from the filthiness of his mouth before he was even allowed to speak to God. You know, if God doesn't like what you're saying, He'll take your voice away and make you mute, just like he did to Zacchaeus, the father of John the Baptist. After he had spoken, God had already removed Moses and Elijah, showing there is no equal but the uniqueness of his son. There were voices of the saints and the prophets who went before us, but there's really only one voice that matters. And the father thundered, Listen to him. Jesus came and touched them and said, Arise and do not be afraid. It seemed like all throughout the Old Testament, Deuteronomy, Joshua, Judges, 2 Kings, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, Daniel, God spoke to his people and told them, Do not be afraid. You see, they needed that reassurance then. And just like the disciples needed it when they were terrified, just like we need it now. When they had their faces hiding in the dirt, who was standing over them protecting them? King Jesus. If God be for us, then who can be against us? 
if you are walking with him, serving him, picking up your cross daily and following him, then just know he will protect you. He goes before you with a mighty outstretched arm. You may only be here in today, but he is already in your tomorrow. Coming down from the mountain, Jesus commanded them to tell no one of what they had seen until the Son of Man had risen from the dead. In Mark, it says they seized upon that statement, discussing with one another what rising from the dead might mean. So you see, the disciples were still having a hard time understanding what Jesus had come, had come for. Because in Jewish thinking, he was supposed to be the Messiah, the coming king, to liberate the Jews from the Romans, to come into the temple, his house, and to rule over his people and reign with a rod of iron. In fact, in the previous chapter, Peter had just declared that he is, he was the Christ and is the Christ, the son of the living God, that the Father had revealed that to him, is what Jesus told him. See, Jesus had only one week ago told him that they must go up, that he must go up to Jerusalem and suffer many things from the elders, the chief pride priests and scribes, and be killed and be raised up on the third day. They were still trying to wrap their heads around, around that. Peter had even taken Jesus aside and began to rebuke him, saying, God forbid it. This shall never happen to you. To which Jesus turned to Peter and said, Get behind me, Satan. You are a stumbling block to me, for you're not setting your mind on God's interest, but man's. Now, I have to point out here that Jesus' message had changed for the first two years or so. It was repent for the kingdom of God is at hand. And now he's speaking about his death. It would be confusing to them until Jesus completed the whole picture after his resurrection. See, they were looking for the kingdom without the cross. And Jesus was saying, there can be no kingdom unless the cross. So now for approximately the next six months, Jesus' message would be just that. And now the journey to the cross begins. If you want to be with Jesus, there will be high mountains to climb to be with him. The disciples didn't give up and say that it was too hard. They made it to the top. They finished what they set out to do, and that was to follow Christ. And Christ was with them the whole way. The climb wasn't easy, but it was so worth it when they got there. Like how my brother put it the other day, when we get there, we'll look around and we'll say, we made it. We're here. Look, there he is right over there. It's so worth it all. It never says that they thought of going back down the mountain to the world, but they said it was good for them to be there. In fact, Peter expressed the desire to just stay there. You know, it would have been easy to stay up there and avoid all the conflict that was going down below in the world. But there was work to do. Jesus said in 9, uh, John 9, 4, we must work the works of him who sent me as long as it is day. Night is coming when no man can work. They may have stayed overnight on the mountain top. Nevertheless, the next day they had come down. You know, we all may have those mountaintop experiences, but sooner or later, we still have to come back to reality. Someday we all, hopefully, taking into consideration true salvation, live eternally up there in full glory. But for right now, we have to be content with our own spirit-led walk and the blessings that we receive and things revealed to us. But for Jesus, his mission lay at the bottom of the mountain where the crowd awaited him. While they were on their way down, they asked Jesus why the scribes say Elijah must come first. And Jesus replied, 
But I say to you that Elijah already came. They did not recognize him. But they did to him whatever they wished, just as it was written of him. So also, the Son of Man is going to suffer at their hands. Well, had Elijah already come? Let's see it in scripture. Let's check this out. I want you all to turn to the book of Malachi. The book of Malachi chapter 3. That's the last book of the Old Testament. Or you can go to Matthew and take a left. Elijah's coming to the Jews' understanding meant that he would be a mighty reformer and that he would restore all things before the Messiah would come and make it fit or ready for him. So when you get there, look at verse 1 in chapter 3. And it says, Behold, I'm going to send my messenger, and he will clear the way before me. That capital me there is Jesus. And the Lord whom you seek will suddenly come to his temple, and the messenger of the covenant, in whom you delight, behold, he is coming, says the Lord of hosts. So you may be saying to yourself, the messenger, that was the prophecy of John the Baptist. Well, then how does Elijah fit in here? Okay, okay. So hold your place right there for a minute because we'll be right back there and turn, if you will, to the Gospel of Luke, chapter 1. The Gospel of Luke, chapter 1, and look up here when you get there. In the Gospel of Luke, chapter 1, uh, John was, uh, let me see, Zacharias, the father of the not yet born John, was performing his priestly duty before God in the temple. And this was done chosen by a lot. This privilege was only afforded once in a lifetime to one qualified to enter into the temple of the Lord to burn incense before him. Okay, so look at Verse 11. And an angel of the Lord appeared to him standing to the right of the altar of incense. And Zacharias was troubled when he saw him, and fear gripped him. But the angel said to him, Do not be afraid, Zacharias, for your petition has been heard, and your wife will bear you a son, and you will give him the name of John. And you will have joy and gladness. And many will rejoice at his birth. There is the one whom they will delight in seeing. For he will be great in the sight of the Lord, and he will drink no wine or liquor. He will be filled with the Holy Spirit, and while yet in his mother's womb, he will turn, he will turn back many of the sons of Israel to the Lord their God. There's the reformer part. And here it is in verse 17. And it is he who will go as a forerunner before him, that's Jesus, in the spirit and the power of Elijah to turn back the hearts of the fathers, back to the children, and to the disobedient, to the attitude of the righteous, so as to make ready a people preparing for the Lord. Okay, now go back to where you have your finger of Malachi, but instead go to chapter 4. In verse 5. And it says there. Behold I am going to send you Elijah the prophet. Before the great coming of the great and terrible day of the Lord. So John the Baptist was. This became in the spirit of Elijah. Is what Jesus was referring to. And that's why they were looking for Elijah. And many believe that Elijah will be the wit one of the witnesses sent in Revelation 11. Well, it may or may not be him. It may be another John the Baptist or someone that comes in the spirit of Elijah. 
But that scripture references what's known as dual fulfillment, where a prophecy is fulfilled in two different places in scripture. Now, John, in the spirit of Elijah, did come before the great and terrible day of the Lord. The first coming was great for all that Jesus had received unto him. And terrible for those who rejected him and will forever be lost in their sins. And another will come before the great and terrible day of the Lord in the end times. So that's why in Matthew 17, 3, then the disciples understood that he had spoken to them about John the Baptist. And when John said to him, they did whatever they wished, and what, excuse me, and when Jesus said to them, they did to him whatever they wished. The Jews had John the Baptist beheaded. Well, in the same way, Jesus also says that the Son of Man is going to suffer at their hands. God's plan was the cross. In a great and terrible day of the Lord, or another translation may say the awesome day of the Lord, will not be awesome, but dreadful. Just as the first coming of the Lord was good news, his second coming will be just the opposite. In fact, it's going to be very bad news for those who are enemies of God and who are enemies of the cross and what Jesus did for us. They will be slain by the word of his power. He is who he said he is. And if you asked him, he would tell you, I am. There was never a time when he didn't exist, and there will be never be a time when his kingdom, the kingdom of God, will come to an end. There is never anything more that you will ever need than him. And without him, you will never have anything of lasting value. No matter what, for the believer, a glorious resurrection awaits us. Our death will only become the victory of reaching the goal. Paul knew that when he said to live is Christ and to die is gain. The vision of the future won't take away from the here and now. We must work out his day for the night is coming when no man can work. The fields are ripe for the harvest. And because of that, we must share his message. And that message is the gospel. Without the cross, we would never see anything but the wrath of God. But Jesus made a way when there was no way. So let me tell you about my Jesus. He set aside his crown. He came at the perfect time in history to be born of a virgin. God in the flesh to live a perfect life. One that we could never live. To provide the only solution to our sin problem that alienates us from God in the first place. We are sinful human beings and sin continuously. So we can never be good enough or qualified enough to pay for our sins before a holy and righteous God. Why Jesus? Because it took God to pay back God for our sins. God cannot live about look upon sin or live with sin. There will be no sin in heaven in full glory. You see, the blood of bulls and goats of the Old Testament only temporarily held back the wrath of God against us, against our sin. We have all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. If there is a crime or sin in this case, there must be a penalty or a sufficient sacrifice to pay for that. And the wages for a crime of sin is death and eternal separation from God. Where? In hell. Eternal torments where the worm never dies and the fire is not quenched. Without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sin. The only perfect solution was for God to send his very own son to pay once for all. Everyone. Everyone in the past, everyone now, and those in the future. He was the only acceptable sacrifice. 
by his scourging, by his stripes, we are healed. By the shedding of his blood, we have our sins washed clean. How was that possible? He was crucified on the cross. The exchange was made right there. He took our sin upon him. He gave us his perfect righteousness. The scriptures say that it pleased God to crush his son. He poured out our wrath upon him. While that was happening, it became dark and many were utterly afraid. And Jesus was screaming out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Separated from his father for us. Because of our sin. Not because of anything he did. He said it was finished. Paid for in full. All the sins in the past, present, and future. Paid for it all. He voluntarily gave up his spirit. He was put into a tomb, hewn out of a rock. And on the third day, just as he said, he arose from the grave by the power of the Holy Spirit, victorious, conquering sin and death. He said, I have the authority laid on my life, and I have the authority to take it back up again. And he is ruling and reigning right now. At the right hand of God the Father. That means. If you confess with your mouth. Jesus is Lord. And believe in your heart. That God raised him from the dead. You will be saved. For as with your heart that you believe. And are justified. And with your mouth that you confess. And are saved. He is coming soon. To judge the living. And the dead. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, it is my prayer that many will see your son in full glory and be with him for all eternity. I pray that this message spoke to those who still haven't made the most important decision they will ever make and that it is fully to repent. Right. Believe the gospel. Accept Jesus as your Lord and Savior. Right now, the choice is theirs to make. Thank you, Lord, for this message that we have heard from you today. And it's in the holy name of Jesus that we pray. Amen. Amen. Now, please, please don't leave here unsaved today. You know, call him by him while it's today. If today, if you hear his voice, if he's talking on your heart, don't ignore that. Not everybody gets that. No one is promised tomorrow. But we will be right here with you after the service to pray with you and to share the real Jesus with you. If you're hearing this message online, reach out to us. We are here for you. Now, I just want to share this one last thing with y'all in closing. Show of hands. If you were able to go back into the womb, would you go? How many of you would go? Why not? Because you know the life you're living out here right now is so much better than that was. Much better, right? Mm -hmm. But if you would have chosen then, we would have all stayed out of fear of the unknown. You know, everything God has given us in Scripture tells us that this isn't our home. We are just traveling through this life to get to our eternal destination. Like being transformed to our very own transfiguration process into full glory. You ever, you ever been somewhere and people ask, like, what, what was it like? And you tell them, you just have to see it for yourself. Well, if you look at the beauty of creation, and we are told this is our temporary our own only, then just know when we get to where God lives in that place, he prepared for us, you will be speechless. Brother and sis brothers and sisters and all who will believe, our God will see that we will all be there together in a place of no more sorrow, no more pain, no more tears, just eternal joy with our Jesus, our Lord, our King. Look at God was done for us. Let me tell you about my Jesus. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. Amen.